No, because you know, I'm I I I think quite in a creative way to be being a lawyer, but I always struggle with with um, with marketing because sometimes marketing in companies is is persuaded, is convinced that with a specific claim they will yeah. sell, that they will take the whole market. But it's not mm-hmm. like that because if you lack the education, if the ingredient, uh, the product is not known yeah. by the consumers, it's not just about the claim. It's It's more yeah. about your strategy, your brand. There is a lot more in selling a product that, than just that single claim that it's not allowed. So why you should take a huge reputational risk if you are a big company to use a certain claim when there is no evidence at the end of the day that this will change completely your, exactly. your, your yeah. turnover. So maybe it's better to think more strategically. Yeah. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Nutri Cosmetics 2030 and today we have a special topic and a special guest with us. Welcome Cesare Varalo uh, is here today with us to talk about the topic. Uh, it was highly requested um, to like to make an episode around this and today we're going to talk about the regulatory aspect of uh, beauty supplements, food supplements, all that. Uh, but be- before we get r- into it, uh, Cesare, please, can I introduce you a little bit because you have quite the resume. So basically, Cesare um, has over a decade of experience in the legal food sector. He's recognized as uh, an innovator and a thought leader uh, in the field of uh, working at the intersection of law, science, and communication. He offers a broad range of multidisciplinary services uh, to food businesses, empowering them to minimize risks and reach their goals in compliance with regulations. Uh, Cesare, how are you today? Thank you. I'm very well. Thank you for the invitation, Matisse. It's a pleasure to be be here. And... um, Yeah, the topic is challenging, but we'll try to do our best to Yeah, it's uh, quite a it. this this topic when I was preparing for uh, for the podcast, I discovered that um there are still a lot of challenges uh around um around uh, the regulatory aspects of of supplements and actually I would like to open with a little bit of um, a story that I found uh, in one of the articles it's quite an old story um, of uh, actually L'Oreal and uh, Nestlé who did a joint venture back in 2004 they launched a beauty supplement but eventually in 2014 they were Um, forced to to end the project. And uh, although it was never fully admitted, there were a lot of speculation that actually one of the main reasons to end the project, uh, I think it was called INEOV, um, was that the regulatory aspect was very challenging and actually they got rejected a quite comprehensive dossier of... Um, uh, of, uh, of So they tried to get like a, a claim approved and it was rejected and uh, it was said back then in the back channels that this was probably one of the main reasons. Um, So uh, this was quite fascinating for me that like even huge companies like L'Oreal and Nestle had a lot of trouble uh, in this uh, this department. Uh, How would you like to comment a little bit on that? Yeah, uh, I can remember more or less the story. And as you said, if two giants like Nestle and L'Oreal failed, uh, people listening to the podcast, small companies could ask, but why can I make it? Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, you can make it. We will explore how today. But probably at that time, the market was not so mature. And uh, Mm -hmm. then uh, L'Oreal and Nestlé, but I would say especially L'Oreal being a cosmetic company, probably realized the complexity of the mm. regulatory framework in the food is uh, is higher than in the, in the cosmetic sector. So when they bump against uh, the European Food Safety Authority, they got claim rejected. Mm-hmm. Probably they got uh, they got a stop. But I'm not sure that it's just only about the claim because with mm. all the means and the money that they could deploy probably 
they face also a problem to create this market category that now is more established and more mature probably than in yeah. 2014. So yeah, probably uh, it would work way better today because like this was really t- like this was actually 20, 20 years ago already when uh, when Laura w- tried to go into nutri cosmetics and supplements. But the question here that I have, because um, we talk here on this podcast a lot. Uh, we mention things like beauty supplements. Uh, but when we were preparing for this for this podcast, you actually um, you you said that like basically the category of beauty supplements does not really exist, right? Not from a regulatory perspective. We have uh, food, we have uh, food supplements, we have uh, cosmetics, mm. and um, maybe a good introduction. Um, to setting the scene for the talk is to define what is a food, food supplement, and what is a, a cosmetic. Because a cosmetic is a product that is used on your skin, on the external part of the body, mainly for cleaning the body, rinsing, for um, aesthetic function. Not mm. for, uh, not to have. N- they are not intended to have an effect on our metabolism, on our physiological function. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't enter into our body. Okay, mm-hmm. still a uh, toothpaste is a, is a cosmetic product, but you are not, so, you're not, um, you're, it's not intended to be ingested by you. Yeah. yeah. While food is anything that is ingested, basically in any form, even if it's an ingredient that will be included then in a composite food mm-hmm. or in a food supplement. Mm-hmm. And a food supplement is nothing else than a food which is containing a substance in a concentrated uh, amount and is uh, supplied in a pre-dose form, like a capsule, like uh, a single shot that the consumer can can assume w- with water or uh, as a capsule. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's liquid or, or, or yeah. solid, but it's a single shot containing a concentrated amount of a certain substance with a physiological effect. So mm. physiological effect is, is the... Is the, is the key distinction that we have between a normal food, a cosmetic, and a food supplement. Mm. So basically, once the thing is ingested, uh, let's say, like, okay, with the toothpaste, you put it in your mouth, but it's not considered food. But once you swallow it down, then it's considered food. Yeah. And uh, here, when we talk about the regulatory aspect, uh, they're, like, these are then like very different world, as I understand. Yeah, yeah, they are very different because the caution for food is is higher mm-hmm. and so and also the the the, the framework for health claims and uh, the beauty claims we will see the difference today mm-hmm. it's stricter basically in food and in cosmetics in cosmetics you have very general principles and guidelines about what you can say or you cannot say on a product mm-hmm. you have of course to substantiate sh- scientifically what you are saying mm-hmm. but you are not you, you have not a list a close list of uh, functional effects and 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 wording that you can use. While in food, we have um, a close catalog of of claims that you can spend from uh, 2006. Basically, the regulation was 1924, 2006. So, mm-hmm. so the so so the the, the difference uh, is uh, is significant, and the basically the regulation behind food supplements, which are are basically foods, it's way more rigorous, as I understand, uh, compared to cosmetics. Yeah. Uh, they're like this distinction between a health claim or a beauty claim is like comes into full effect here. Yeah, yeah. Um, the regulation is more strict. And um, speaking of claims, again, uh, before coming to the beauty claims, which uh, we we might argue are not even regulated claims, mm-hmm. we have to define what is a health claim or a nutrition claim mm-hmm. made on food at EU level. So. A uh, nutrition claim is a claim speaking of the amount of a substance in a food, okay? We have uh, no added sugars, we have high level of protein. This is a nutrition claim. An health claim is something connecting the presence or the quantity of a food to a physiological effect. It might mm-hmm. be something that affects your body, but also your psychological and uh, mental function. So anything mm-hmm. that is ingested and can have a physiological effect on your body uh, to claim this effect 
should have been evaluated beforehand by the European Food Safety Authority. So you need to have an approved health claim in this list mm. of, of, of approved mentions. So in this sense, uh, the food space is much more regulated than, uh, than cosmetic. Mm. Um, we, we can also say that um, for food supplements and food, the rules about claims are basically the same. Even if food supplements are perceived as closer to medicines or uh, food for special medical purposes, the regulation is the same. And for both categories, you can never claim that uh, the food or the ingredient is preventing any disease or, or is curing any disease. This is very important because that's, that's, a, that's a stop in all categories, okay? Mm -hmm. Unless you are a pharma, unless you are medicine, you cannot mm -hmm. claim that. So yeah, that's, this is, this this is really, another category. This is this question which like when a lot of brands, they are trying to figure out how to actually market food supplements and beauty supplements. Um, basically, what can they say about them without them basically placing them on the market like as medicine which uh, we saw that like it's not allowed here yeah no if you want to stay out of the medicine uh, sector which is again heavily regulated from <clears throat> from a certain aspect it's more easy because you, it's so strict that you need just to put into the medicinal products substances and ingredients allowed with certain purity criteria so mm -hmm. it's uh, and everything it's pre-approved so it's 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 very strict but if you want to stay there uh, out from this sector you just need to avoid any medical claim no prevention no cure of diseases mm -hmm. the 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 maximum that you are allowed to claim on a food is that you control a risk factor of a disease. For instance, we have claims on beta-glucans that might control the cholesterol, and mm -hmm. cholesterol is, of course, a risk factor in cardiovascular disease, but you can never target in a claim directly the disease. It, it's gonna prevent your cholesterol getting Exactly, high. you are just preventing a risk factor. Yeah, and, okay. Uh, so when I was doing the research, I went into like the, the claim registers and everything, and certain ingredients, um, they have claims that are allowed, even health claims that are allowed, for instance, like vitamins, some vitamins, so like z ingredients like zinc and, and so on. But basically a lot of ingredients that are used um, in supplements, they don't have approved, approved claims. So here, as I understand, to stay on the safe side, we have to operate more in the realm of, of beauty claims, which are different than health claims. So can you uh, talk a little bit more on the beauty claims also and maybe give us some examples? Yeah, yeah. Now I'll try to define the difference between those two. Mm category of claims okay if you stay in the um, health claim area so physiological function psychological functions we have this regulation 1924 2006 which oblige all the companies to get an approval to use claims uh, beforehand so you have to submit a scientific dossier to the european food safety authority get a regulation from the european commission and then once the claim is approved, you can use it, okay? Mm. So uh, that's strict. But if you're doing a beauty claim, you might uh, get a bit more freedom. Why? Because a beauty claim is not necessarily considered under the scope of this regulation 1924. Mm. The, we have a fine line that distinguish the two, the two categories, but for instance, it's uh, quite clear now that if you just claim that uh, your hair or your skin will be more uh, glowing or your hair will uh, gain volume from assuming a supplement, you are in, in the area of the, of the beauty claims. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and why we can say that? Because it's not just an effect on a physiological function, even if on borderline claims like... Uh, hair growth or skin hydration, we might discuss a lot if there is mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. But if you're simply saying, you know, your, 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 your nails will be thicker or your skin will be glowing, uh, you are probably are in the area of the beauty claims. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what is interesting, what I can tell the audience is that if you look at the European Food Safety Register of Claims, it's also very instructive to look at what has been rejected, not what, just what has been accepted by the 
Mm -hmm. European Food Safety Authority, because in the past, several companies applied for beauty claims to EFSA, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. EFSA rejected the application, stating this is none of our business. This is not an health claim, so we cannot approve this. Mm -hmm. If it's just skin glowing, probably it's more like a, a beauty claim, a cosmetic mm -hmm. effect. So we don't have the legal category of beauty supplements and beauty claims, but we have a uh, we have a space that has been uh, more or less defined by by the praxis, by the practice. Mm. So, as I understand correctly, um, if you look at um, the beauty claims that were kind of like looked at uh, from EFSA's side, uh, and they were rejected, um, and they said, "Okay, this is not a health claim." Uh, but basically, will they say you can still use it as a as a beauty claim, or how does it work? EFSA is mainly a scientific body, so they weigh evidence and they decide if there is a relationship of cause-effect between the consumption of something and what mm -hmm. you want to claim. In that case, they didn't even enter in the scientific evaluation of, mm -hmm. of the indication. They simply said, this is not a physiological function, this is not a psychological function, this is mm -hmm. not about children growth, so it's out yeah. of the scope. Okay, of so the regulation is, and, and yeah. our mandate. So yeah. they didn't say this is a beauty claim. They yeah, say, okay. So they, this is a, yeah, they said this is not a health claim, so we are... Exactly. So we can assume that certain claims are not physiological. And that's the area where beauty claim can move with a bit of <laughs> certainty. We, we mm -hmm. still see that there are uncertainty, especially at member states level, on how mm -hmm. such claims are evaluated. But... EFSA clearly said these are not health claims, so they are something different. And listening to you, um, another example that I found in my research comes to mind uh, where this distinction between beauty and health claims, it can be a little bit like, as it, it can be a little bit borderline. And, and this example is, is way more recent. It comes from 2023 and it actually comes from UK, where not EFSA, but the Advertising Association um, rejected um not reject they did not reject the claim but they uh they uh, said to the brand that you are not allowed to claim this anymore in your advertising and it was uh, it was a collagen product and they claimed that the product could maintain skin elasticity reduce fine lines and wrinkles and achieve thicker hair so at first it sound sounds kind of like a beauty claim but I guess they considered it differently. Yeah, um, we have two layers to consider here. Um, on top of the fact that UK is not anymore in Europe, so even if the legislation is still, uh, I would say, 90% in line with ours, they will probably detach in uh, health claims or other areas like approval of new ingredients or new foods. The first layer is the one of the health claim regulation, okay, to decide if this is an health claim or not, okay. Um, if we decide that such a claim on the collagen product is an health claim, the answer is, of course, you cannot advertise at all mm -hmm. because it's not approving the list as such. But if I remember correctly, the, the point there is that the Advertising Standard Authority in UK challenged the company even if they add inside of the product other ingredients that might support claims. Mm -hmm. Because they were just uh, uh, thinking that in terms of advertising of, of the message that is being conveyed to consumers, the product was misleading. And here mm -hmm. we have the second layer, which is advertising. Okay, mm -hmm. On top of food legislation, we have still uh, the um, EU directives on unfair commercial practices, unfair communication to consumers. And in each country of Europe, and even in UK, which is uh, still quite in line with, uh, with uh, the enforcement as well, we have those kind of authorities that judge on misleading advertising. Mm -hmm. 
on the basis of general principles. So uh, let's assume that this is not considered a health claim, it's a beauty claim because we speak about fine lines and wrinkles and that's mm -hmm. a typical example of beauty yeah. claim. Maybe elasticity would be more on the health elasticity side. Elasticity right? will be more on the health side, but fine line and wrinkles, I checked some documents as well before the interview, was considered plainly by Food Supplements Europe, the, the mm -hmm. trade association of, of the sector in their own guidance, like a beauty claim, okay? Mm. It's okay to do a claim on fine line and wrinkles in any case. Uh, no, because still you are bound by advertising rules. So you, you need to be able to substantiate scientifically this claim and mm -hmm. you, not, uh, you don't have to make it too, too loud, let's say too, too bold, because if you push yeah. too much on, on the effects, of course you might mm -hmm. mislead the consumer. So, so basically, as we saw here, uh, the advertising was done but all this was regulated kind of like it, it was regulated post-market. So yep. I guess they were reported by either clients or even competitors maybe. And then they were checked and they, they were said like, you cannot, uh, you cannot use this anymore. But let's say when this happens, um, can you talk a little bit more? Okay, so you are going to be looked at like how how does this process usually look like usually um it looks like um it's look like a mess because anything it's not <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking because anything is not clearly regulated at eu level by regulations it's left to the discretion of the competent authority of each mm -hmm. member state mm -hmm. so uh especially when they have to apply very general principles like the one on advertising, mm -hmm. we might have different decisions by a competition authority in Italy, an advertising authority in France, and mm -hmm. so on. So the enforcement is not by, by the treaty about the functioning of the European Union, is not up to the European Commission or any union bodies up to the member states. So mm -hmm. they decide what to enforce, how to enforce, and how to sanction. So... It would not be a surprise to me to know that we we saw different positions and different takes on the same beauty claim in different countries. It happened mm -hmm. in the past, even with health claims, okay, or generic mentions like, for instance, I'll give you an example, detox. Detox mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. not, of course, a, a, an health claim. You cannot find in the register any detoxification claim approved, but if you link the detox word as a generic claim to uh, some approved health claim that might substantiate this detox effect, mm -hmm. that might be, I don't know, about your uh, your uh, urinary efficiency, let's say, or other, or other effects, certain countries will accept this claim. We mm -hmm. had a case a few years ago where detox was, was, was a no-go in countries like Germany and was absolutely accepted in others. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised that on beauty claims we will see the same, especially now that the sector is, is expanding because they're... Mm -hmm. Okay, we will talk a little bit more at the end, like how do you see the future and how maybe this yeah. will be put in order. Um, but so we see there are different jurisdictions. The, the, the rulings could be, could be different in different countries. But what I, what I would like to explore since we saw that this was... Um, regulated by the advertising um, association, uh, not by EFSA, for instance. Uh, what's the situation around, for instance, influencer marketing or, or like more indirect kind of kind of claiming things about the product? For instance, like yeah, influencer marketing or customer reviews. How does this work? Well, that's new frontier for advertising and also for the regulators, okay? Because we don't have in many countries, uh, I would say in no countries, a strict regulation on influencers' activity, for instance, mm -hmm. or endorsement from medical associations. Mm -hmm. We have case law, we have guidance, we have principles. So mm -hmm. let's, let's take a step back. How it's working, this post-market enforcement? It's working that if consumers, competitors... Um, trade association signal to one of these authority your practice you might get challenged and according to the national rules you might get huge fines up to millions of euro if you are a big company or you can get your advertising blocked by by all the the advertisers and the tv and so on 
So those are mainly the two effects, okay? And um, so this is how it's working. When it comes to influencer that's, uh, that, uh, and, uh, and other indirect kind of marketing, um, the landscape is even more fragmented because the main problem is how to intercept all these practices on the market for the authorities. Because mm. uh, who is an influencer is not defined. You, how many followers do you need to be an influencer? 10,000? 1 million? Mm. I would say that it depends from your niche, your market. You might be very effective with 10,000 and uh, totally yeah. ineffective with 1 million generic followers if you advertise a beauty supplement. So mm -hmm. um, they don't know exactly who to control. But uh, several countries, and I would say Italy was on the forefront of that, and uh, the Advertising Standard Authority in UK as well, already required to uh, influencers to disclose the fact that they are advertising a product with hashtag like ADV, mm -hmm. advertising, paid promotion. Um, and this is in line with the general practices about fair advertising because if it's mm. hidden if the citizen thinks that someone is uh, promoting is is telling on the social media that the product is useful it's working mm -hmm. because they tried tried it and it was working very well it's very different from a paid promotion yes in terms of effect on on the consumer and their behavioral uh, they they behavior on the market they purchasing choices so uh there are rules. The problem is how to enforce them. But I would not convey health claims or uh, other kind of uh, scientific information through an influencer because at 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 the at the, nowadays it's clear that influencers are a way to advertise products. It's advertising, you know. Mm -hmm. And the hashtag ADV it tells you that it's advertising. Yeah. So, so you have to be quite careful on on, yeah. on that. So also brands who use. Uh, influencers as a form of marketing they have to uh, comply comply and be yeah. careful and like uh, have uh, like processes in place that would actually like uh, educate the influencers that they work with um, to still be compliant uh, compliant with the rules um, here I would also like to touch on a um, on a point that, uh, so we see here, there are health claims, there are beauty claims, like how you navigate this thing. Um, but on, you know, the first thought would be, if, let's say I have, a, I have a food supplement, the first thought would be, oh, I need to get, get like a health claim approved, right? And this will solve all my problems. I can, for instance, claim this supplement will improve your skin hydration, which is clearly a uh, a health claim but then I had another thought so once you have something like this approved like a health claim then everyone can claim that right yeah uh, an approval of an health claim is generic unless you the claim is linked to an ingredient which is a secret let's say a proprietary formula if you mm. get a claim on vitamin C or collagen anybody uh, then can use it. But I want to make you uh, ask you a question. Mm -hmm. But do you really think that is a claim is absolutely necessary to market a product? Why you are consuming collagen? Why you should yeah. nowadays buy this, collagen this is the, supplement? This is the second part ah, of, okay. of, of, my, of my thought. <laughs> is that basically when we have, um, when we don't have health claim approved, exactly. it also means that this can be an opportunity. Yeah. So basically, the first part of the opportunity is that you might compete on the creativity of like how you explain the product in a way that you are still compliant, you're safe. Uh, and basically, you can, you can compete with this on the market. And the second part is that maybe even using ingredients who, that don't have like exact health claims approved, but are in the minds of consumers, like, for instance, when you say collagen, a lot of people will connect collagen, okay, better skin, better hair, thicker nails, something like that. So basically, you can stay on the safe side a little bit more with using ingredients that are more in the, the, the minds of the consumers with the claims there already. Yeah. 
I would argue that if uh, the ingredient is well recognized, the claim will help, but is not the first selling point. Because the claim, most of the time, is is not even so evident on the front of pack. What do you see is uh, collagen, vitamin uh, C, it's, Mm. uh, I don't know, um, you know, uh, coenzyme Q10. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, it's like building a brand. If you build credibility in your ingredient and the science is is out there and is telling the consumer that the ingredient is working, sometimes you don't need to have strong claims on the pack mm-hmm. and you can still build a market and a sector. A good example is probiotics. You know that for years the commission considered just the term probiotic itself as a health claim. So it was not allowed in in, in Europe, in general, uh, now it's allowed in some countries because they did mm. guidance on the specific use of the term probiotic. But everybody knew that probiotic were good for gut health and were buying probiotics. And the companies use wisely the indirect marketing, uh, building platforms, building associations that were developing this culture of probiotics and the scientific evidences of probiotics without attaching them to the label, Mm -hmm. without attaching Mm -hmm. them directly to the product. Because when you are selling the product, is there where you have the problem, where you need to comply with all the rules about home pack claims, advertising Mm -hmm. claims. When you simply do scientific research activity with universities, uh, conferences, meetings, and, and building mm-hmm. platforms, you, you can explore, of course, yeah. the science and the benefits. So, so it's basically it's, more uh, bringing awareness around a, exactly. an ingredient or a topic um, to the consumers. And yes, like in the case of probiotics, uh, a lot of companies did that. And like the exactly. general awareness of probiotics is, yes, if I... T- Take, exactly. If I eat a probiotic yogurt, exactly. it will help with my with my gut health. Exactly. Another thing, but let's say we still want to go for the health claim. Yeah, of course. Then this is way way harder, as we saw in yeah. the in the initial example with the Nestlé and uh, and L'Oreal. Uh, they got it rejected. Although I checked, it was a a, a, a dossier of twenty nine clinical studies. And it was still rejected. So I guess this process is very, very hard. Yeah, yeah. I cannot comment on that dossier, Mm. but 29 studies looks uh, like a lot. Mm. Um, It it all depends on the quality of the studies, uh, where the studies were coming from, and, and a lot of factors, you know. Even when you do randomized trials, it all depends about the, 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 the size of the sample, who you are, you know, how you do the sample can, can, can mm-hmm. lead to very different results in a study. But I have no, no awareness of, of that case. Um, but surely it's difficult. Uh, you know, I, years ago, I think, I'm not sure it was a German lawyer or a company, they challenged EFSA in... Um, uh, um, submitting a dossier about uh, water and hydration, mm-hmm. and the claim was rejected because okay. they <laughs> no, <laughs> and they challenged also the EFSA in the Court of Justice at the European level to say why why you rejected this claim because the bar is so high that sometimes um, the evidence is out there, mm-hmm. but you cannot connect the the, the evidence uh, the the assumption of an ingredient to the effect. You cannot establish a direct cause effect relationship. And that's the hard part because, you know, a diet is multifactorial. You eat a lot of different foods and stuff. So, And, of course, on certain body function, we have also other interference. So it's very hard to pass this bar. Mm-hmm. It's not impossible, but it's a lengthy procedure. You, it takes two, three years, uh, I would say, as an average. Uh, you need to provide a lot of evidence. And especially on beauty claims or borderline claims involving uh, let's say, beauty effects on skin and nails, hairs, we don't have clear guidances. So Mm -hmm. it's not easy, it's not easy but to to build there. But of course, if you if you can go for a claim and you get it, you it's still uh, it would be still a nice development for but for the entire sector, as you mentioned, because you won't be the only one to use it. So but the basically the substantiation of the claim has to be very significant, has to be very clear, probably. And you have to consider that EFSA is just evaluating the scientific evidence which is available or submitted by the applicant. Okay, they mm-hmm. cannot do 
They don't do research. studies on, on their own. Too. So it will be everything on you. If something is missing, is lacking, uh, yeah. it will be up to you to, to, to provide more evidence. And, and that's why the procedure is lengthy, because sometimes the dossier is not rejected immediately, but mm -hmm. they ask for more and more pieces of evidence along the road, and you have to try to to comply now they change a bit the procedural rules of EFSA which are very complex they give also a sort of presumption advice if mm -hmm. you want to submit a dossier so mm -hmm. if you if you want to prepare a dossier for an health claim or a novel food you can do a presumption to EFSA to ask if more or less you, you are providing all the pieces mm -hmm. and they will will help you in in shaping a dossier but still it's mm. It's it's a complex procedure. It's not for everybody. Let's say. So. Yeah, <laughs> probably probably very very challenging. Yeah. <laughs> very challenging yeah. process. But until now, we basically we were more in the doom and gloom like category, saying like this is very hard, this is very challenging, and everything. But I would maybe like to move um, a little bit more because we still see there is a lot of supplements on the market. So. Um, so things are things are doable. So maybe I would not now try to put myself into a little little bit of a different position. And let's say I am a new brand or like a, an established brand who would like to add a supplement to to my, my portfolio. And basically, I would like to explore a little bit the strategies of uh, of compliance uh, in the market. And um, I would like to discuss with you a little bit how to approach and how, what you would suggest to me um, when I approach going to market. What should I be like um, careful of and uh, basically what would be your advice? Well, uh, there are different strategies. It depends from the supplements, uh, the size of your company, your, your, your financial means and all the rest. But I would say that uh, you have different ways to achieve the objective. One is to try to stay in the beauty claim area. So claiming something that is not regulated. Um, in this case, probably I would advise to do a country by country assessment with, with, a, with a specialist testing the market before entering, you know, mm -hmm. with, with uh, you know, all the two feet inside because, uh, you know, we, 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 uh, we said that, that you might face challenges. But first thing is moving in the space of beauty claim. The second would be to add to your formulation other ingredients with approved health claims, which are very similar to the one you want, you uh, want to claim. You want to you want to claim. You want to you you want to get. So you can co-formulate your 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 supplement in powder or liquid with other vitamins, minerals, or substances, which allows already to state uh, something around skin, hair, nails. Uh, mm -hmm. We have vitamin C. We have biotin. We have zinc. We have. Uh, a lot of substances that might be useful to this end. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, this is quite a common strategy that we see yeah. in the supplement space. So basically, we kind of all know uh, which ingredient is bringing the benefits. But yes, we use other ingredients to substantiate yeah. the claims. A very common strategy is to, for instance, write also that the supplement is based uh, on collagen or, for instance, collagen on the market, but co-formulate with other vitamins. That's a classic mm -hmm. example, okay? And this will be completely fine. Another thing that you can try to do is uh, to look long-term, try to expand your business in uh, markets that are less regulated, especially if we speak of substances that we know are safe. Mm -hmm. So you can get traction, you can get revenues, you can get market shares, and then eventually you can come back to Europe, not just to uh, take all this, this, this mountain of getting an health claim approved, but um, also spending the approval that you might and obtain in other countries in Europe to, to strengthen your position. That's a very common strategy, both for supplements and, and mm. for novel foods ingredients as well, okay? Because once uh, you know, a regulator see that something is approved in US, in Canada, in Japan, in, uh, in a lot of regulated yeah. markets like Europe might, might be more open uh, as well to your, uh, to, your, to, to your position, to your petition. So I would say those are the main strategies, okay? And, and then, of course, building the reputation of your ingredients, your supplements, as we mentioned before, for 
probiotics or collagen, which are well known to consumers. Because if you don't have the reputation, what's the point in getting a health claim approved? An mm -hmm. health claim on an unknown substance, which is very cumbersome and complex in its wording, won't be effective in marketing uh, in exactly. the marketing world. You yes. know, yes. it yes. won't sell. So that's yeah. So basically, um, yes. If I think as a new brand owner, it's uh, actually maybe when I'm listening to you, what comes to mind is like, okay, stay simple. Use ingredients that are as known as possible. And basically try to uh, use as, as much time as possible on like thinking about how to actually build a business and not not use not just build it on on claims what the product does but like use all the other like leverages also that can help you like, yeah. popularize <clears throat> like uh, yeah. your product. No, because you know I'm I I I think quite in a creative way to be being a lawyer, but I always struggle with with um, with marketing because sometimes marketing in companies is is persuaded, is convinced that with a specific claim they will yeah. sell, that they will take the whole market, but it's not mm -hmm. like that because if you lack the education, if the ingredient, uh, the product is not known yeah. by the consumers, it's not just about the claim, it's. It's more yeah. about your strategy, your brand. There yeah. is a lot more in selling a product that, than yeah. just that single claim that it's not yeah. allowed. So why you should take a huge reputational risk if you are a big company to use a certain claim when there is no evidence at the end of the day that this will change completely your, your, exactly. your yeah. turnover. So maybe it's better to think more strategically. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And me as a, as a guy who comes from marketing, it's like we often say relying on product claims. It's a little bit of a lazy way of doing marketing. Exactly. Because you are, yes, you are trying to like put it in the hands of the product and, and everything and like, yeah, yeah, like be product led and everything. But kind of when the product works, it works. You just have to put it in the hands of the consumer somehow and then you don't have to actually say it will make your skin more elastic you just need to get to a point where they see that the skin is more elastic it doesn't have to say on the on the label so exactly. but then we are in a completely different game um so it's not the lazy game anymore let's say now i i would say that uh, what is important to mention here is that you have also a lot of unfair competition mm -hmm in the e-commerce space, especially of brands coming outside of Europe with all their operations and companies and facilities established outside of Europe doing uh, e-commerce in Europe, shipping directly to consumers. Because when you adopt this strategy, basically you are selling one pack or few packs to consumers, you are skipping all the custom checks you are skipping all the official controls on the market. So maybe it won't be a popular opinion, but cross-border e-commerce is an issue. But it's an issue in Europe. It was an issue in China a few years ago. They threatened to completely close the e cross-border e-commerce in China. Then mm. they decided to not doing that, but mm. it's creating huge disparities. And uh, and so sometimes you are, you are tempted to... To, yes. to adopt, you know, to, to yeah, move to the same. dark side. Yeah. <laughs> it does that and like uh, exactly. risk it a little bit. with Because exactly. uh, um, let's say one strategy would also be try to use the claims that you know that you shouldn't use and then just like, yeah, uh, deal with the fines. Okay. Um, if your business, because you said, you mentioned before, it depends on the size of your business. But I guess also the bigger your business, the bigger the fines can get, right? Yeah, and um, my experience, in my experience, is the reputational risk that uh, scares the big company, not the fines, because uh, mm. the fines, okay, still have a limit. So if you are making billions and billions, you can pay one, three, five millions, like me and you can pay ten thousand euro, let's mm. say, in a small mm. company. Yeah. So it's it's all relative, but uh, the reputational risk it's too high for big brands. Mm. To, to take certain risks yeah, because they invested in that for, for years. Yeah, and, and we, so. see, we see that also uh, in the space that basically a lot of companies, they think about adding supplements because the evidence, it's there uh, like from the business side and also from the review side from the customers. But yes, they, a lot of companies, they are still uh, reluctant of uh, getting into space just like 
a lot because of the regulatory issues. Um, but here um, on this on this point, uh, so we see this this space is complex. It is it, there are ways to navigate it, uh, but it's still it's still complex and requires attention. But how do you see maybe a little bit the future of this? Are there new developments? Uh, you do you have maybe some inside? In, not information, but like inside, like ideas. Uh, that because you are more in contact with with uh, with the space, what is happening here in this uh, in this landscape? Well, uh, surely the market for beauty supplements is is growing. The market, I would say, for cosmetics is growing, especially for men or I don't know for women if it's steady or still growing. But mm. um, it's uh, it's market of interest. Uh, in terms of regulations, we, we are not seeing much in this, uh, in this space, to be honest. Now we will have European elections in a few months, in June. So we will change the European commissions and probably will change the priorities. To be honest, mm -hmm. in this uh, term, we didn't saw a lot of new heavy regulations being launched. It was all about uh, the Green Deal, the environmental claims, environmental practices, and, and other areas of the food law that has been touched. Um, so honestly, we don't know. What is interesting from a policy perspective is that recently the, um, there has been a push towards the Commission, a political push, for instance, to um, solve the long-standing issue of the botanical claims on mm -hmm. supplements, okay. which could be a, an entire podcast uh, itself. But to explain the problem very briefly, uh, the point about botanical claims is that from 2006, when we had the regulation, all botanical claims has been put on hold by the European Food Safety Authority because if they have been evaluated with the strict criteria that mm -hmm. EFSA is applying, they would have been all rejected and repealed. So now we have this flourishing market for also for botanical supplements that are still enjoying certain claims uh, without proper substantiation, I would say, because they don't have specific doses, a specific wording prescribed by the European Commission. So now there is the, this push to unlock this situation after nearly 20 years nowadays, and this could be interesting because the, the way forward for beauty claims, for botanicals, probably is to create a new regulatory path, mm -hmm. especially for the EFSA evaluation, because we cannot adopt the same standard, in my opinion, for a botanical, for a regular supplement, for a beauty claim, and for a product that is, is, is given to to infant for their development, uh, mm. which is, of course, much more sensitive and already has a, a slightly different approval procedure for EFSA and is, is, is considered by a different article in the health claim regulation. So probably the, the right way forward from a policy perspective would be to design new paths for these new food categories. And we, we but we can have much more examples, okay? We have a lot of innovation now, you know, alternative proteins that are safe but still have to be approved as novel food, precision fermentation, new genomic techniques that are not exactly the same of the GMOs, but we are still using the old tools, mm -hmm. the old regulatory tools which are not suited for the, for the, for the job. Mm -hmm. So we need to move a bit forward, otherwise we will be stuck in this regulatory landscape forever, which is honestly hindering innovation in Europe um making investor doing a step back from Europe in a lot of areas so mm -hmm. we, we risk uh, with too much red tape and too much rigidity to to harm our our system so I I would like to see a change in this uh, in this mm -hmm. regulatory landscape it's uh, it's it's many years that I'm pushing in yeah. this direction but you know mm. and that was actually uh, my my next question like what mm. would you personally <laughs> wish for uh like more regulation uh less regulation but as i understand uh probably your biggest wish would be like a completely separate regulatory framework that would basically put things in order i would like to see better regulation better. <laughs> 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 no, not that the European regulation is bad. Not at all. Okay, especially in terms of principles, we we are very good. We are very clear. 
Sometimes at member state level, we have diverging interpretation, but it's not about the law. The law, it's, it's, the baseline is good. Mm. But at the moment, we have too much hurdles, too much procedures. We, we have to be more agile, and we have to think that to put in place a regulation takes two, three, five years. Uh, the European Parliament, the Commission, there is a lot of discussions. on. It's not efficient. It's not keeping the pace with innovation. We have to find mm -hmm. more flexible instruments to regulate certain areas, yeah. or we have to and, devote and, and more and resources. This is, this is actually uh, maybe an interesting point also to to touch a little bit on. Because, yeah. um, yes, before we said, like, try to use things that are in mind of the consumers, try to stay on the safe side. But then we also have this whole side of innovation. A lot of companies trying to innovate, trying to find new solutions um, for health, for, 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 let's say, healthy aging, all this. And they are probably, because they're investing a lot of time energy money um into into doing those things but then they kind of hit the wall when once it comes to regulation and this is yeah quite uh, discouraging and then it is discouraging and, and again is shifting the, the the investments the attention to other markets because if we think also about this new development okay you are looking for an anti-age ingredient okay that's something very complex most probably if you find one will fall under the novel food regulation in Europe. So again, you will need two or three years just to get the ingredient approved. Mm -hmm. Then you have to get a claim approved eventually. So the system is very rigid. If you move in another landscape like, like US, which is not nece necessarily better in terms of regulation, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a complex system. It's old, even older than ours. So they have a lot of regulation in place. You don't have all these obstacles. You might get an approval for new dietary ingredients in supplements, but it's much more agile. If you mm. want to do a claim, you might face, again, huge reputational risk, class actions, challenges from advertising authorities, but you don't have a closed list of functional claims. So you can go on the market with your own studies and under your own responsibility claim something. That's, again, not necessarily good because when we draft our legislation in Europe, the commission did a survey and they found something like 20,000 health claims on the market at the time and 95% was cut down because totally mm. crazy and not, 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 founded, uh, not, not grounded in science. But still, it's a system that allows for more flexibility. Mm. At the moment here, we, it's, it's, it's very difficult to innovate unless you have a lot of resources, time, and... Uh, mm. So basically, plan. when I listen to yeah. you, the idea that comes to head is that here in Europe, we are not uh, making ourselves any favors uh, in, this, in this space. And as you said, yes, uh, there is a need for better regulation. Because um, also, the, like, we, like, like we talk quite a lot about on this podcast, the consumer needs are here the consumers they want to use these kind of this kinds of products they kind of want to use them to improve either their health or their their looks or or whatever um but so we are also this regulation doesn't do any favors to the general public not only the companies no because uh, today you can buy anything online from every country so if you are too strict, the risk is also that consumers will buy on suspicious platforms or um, supplements from other countries that contain substances that might be really dangerous for, for, mm. for your health. So once the safety is assessed, uh, I would say that we, 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 we did, uh, the, the regulators did their job. Okay, then, of course, about the claims, what you can claim or not, we can discuss. But th the baseline is a safety. Here we have a lot of consumers which cannot find certain hormones or steroids on the European market. And they are simply buying on Internet from, from other countries where they are still mm -hmm. marketed. So, yeah, we have to be very aware of this market dynamic that, uh, in my opinion, are not so well known to the regulators, are well known to the companies that live mm. in, in yeah. the sector. So it's better to have something regulated 
yeah which is safe on the but, market that yeah. yeah but in the end i think this uh this actually gives me hope because when yeah. there is a consumer need uh there is of course first push from the companies uh, for more actually like this is one of the rare cases where where companies would like more regulation better regulation um but i think um since there is big there is this big consumer need like um the this 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 uh, regulatory um landscape will have to will have to follow in the end yeah absolutely we'll have to evolve uh, we hope for for the best uh but it's it's very it's very hard to predict now because we again we we are in a in an era of changing not just in Europe but uh, mm -hmm. everywhere in the world you know and just writing a newsletter about the biggest threats to the food supply system this year what is the biggest threats elections because half of the world is electing their representative this year US mm -hmm. Europe Brazil True. a lot of big countries are taking big decisions with with wars going on so this is more <laughs> philosophical if you want part yeah, of another this podcast, podcast. <laughs> it's another podcast but but that's that's exactly what we we, we cannot know uh, honestly the we are facing big challenges the regulators have we, we can we can say much more important things to do like i don't know climate change uh, mm -hmm. they have they have huge challenges ahead bigger than a, than a health claim but uh, we still have to think about our companies our markets our consumers if we stay too close we we will lose the train of of innovation and uh, and in the global economy, simply the the, the, the attention, the money, and then the markets will 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 shift away. So mm. that's True. that's the main risk. True. And uh, <clears throat> on this note, uh, and I know that uh, I think today we barely scratched the surface of of, of this of this conversation. And as we mentioned uh, before, we would love to have you uh, on this podcast again to go maybe a little bit deeper into certain topics that. Uh, we were talking about and we would uh, still like to cover but at this point uh, Cesare I would really like to thank you for this uh, very uh, enlightening conversations uh, conversation um, as I say when whenever I have like guests on this podcast like I learn so much uh, so I uh, really thank you for for this conversation thank you Matisse it was very interesting thank you mm -hmm.